All right. Um, hi, I'm Blake Borgeson. This is not the first slide of my talk. This is just uh, for anyone else who's just kind of getting into biology from a different field. That's what I did. I came from software. I did internet software. Just a few years ago, I got into biology. This book was extremely useful. It's kind of like a, uh, a molecular biology for dummies. I found it extremely useful um, and helpful. If you take a look at that and find that it's too easy, this is the real book of molecular biology that kind of everybody uses. If the first one's too easy, this one is, is a, good, a good one to move up to. Um, but yeah, so I'm Blake Borgeson. I'm at the Marcotte Lab here at UT Austin. Um, I'm, and I appreciate the organizers giving me a chance to speak. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a project that I've been doing here called uh, All by All Learning of Protein Complexes from Mass Spectrometry Data. And hopefully, if it's not clear what that means, it'll become clear. Um, this is going to be a little bit more of just a, a user case of, of Python and machine learning, just to kind of show one way that it can be applied to a biology problem. I'm not going to talk about tools that I've written. I haven't written tools for bioinformatics. Um, I'm kind of just a consumer at this point, and I'm trying to take the tools that are being produced in the bioinformatics community and, and machine learning community and apply them to biology problems. So hopefully it'll just give you a taste of, of one type of problem that all these tools are being used for and I'll talk a little bit about how I'm using those tools. Um, so I'd like to start off showing one of these pictures. This is uh, one of the beautiful illustrations by a scientist named David Goodsell of the interior contents of a cell. He's a scientist at Scripps. This is a human B cell that's preparing to secrete antibodies. And, um, and what I want to call out is just that the interior of a cell is just chock full of uh, protein complexes. These big, these big bodies all across the cell are um, Mish mishmashes of different proteins that come together. Complexes. It takes an RNA template and amino acids, and from that makes proteins, which which make all these complexes and make life work. Um, Codimer, this uh, set of proteins around the outside here that makes a shell that makes this actual budding off of the endoplasmic reticulum that enables the cell to excrete the antibodies, which is the purpose of this B cell. And then the proteasome here. Um, the proteasome is a machine that's in charge of degrading proteins inside the cell. And this, like any of the others, is a, um, is a protein complex. It's made of a bunch of different proteins, in this case, about 30 proteins. So we've gotten quite good in biology at measuring certain things. We can measure the genome really well, which is kind of like our parts list. It tells us what all the proteins are that are present. Um, we can measure the proteome, so um, using mass spectrometry, which I'll talk about a little bit, we can measure the levels of all of the proteins, in other words, the, the number of each of those parts that we have in the cell. But um, kind of a different way of looking at it is complexes. We still don't have very good ways of even just measuring which proteins are stuck with which other proteins, making these machines that make life possible. So we've actually done a pretty good job at it in just recent years in yeast and E. coli. We have a long way to go in humans and other animals. We think that the vast majority of these stable protein machines are not even known just in terms of what the proteins are that make them up, which is a, an important part of understanding the function of all of these genes and, and how biology works at this level. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, before I get into how we do it, I'll tell you how it's been done for the last several years, which is kind of a one-by-one -one process of mapping these out. So. Um, the simple, the simple gist of it is you take your protein, you, you kind of choose a protein and you want to find the complexes that your protein is involved in. So you've got your protein of interest, this red one here, and you put a tag on it, just attach something so that you can pull it out of solution later with something rec that recognizes that tag. You express the tagged version of this protein in your biological sample. <clears throat> you hope that it forms the same complexes that the native protein forms. That in other words, binding with these other blue proteins to form the complex that it forms natively. And then you, and then you, can, use an, sorry, then you can use an antibody against that tag and an affinity column and basically pull this whole um, protein and anything stuck to it out of the sample. And you can run that through what's called a mass spectrometry machine, which, which measures the levels of every protein in your sample. So that tells you all the proteins that your protein was stuck to. And so you can do this one by one and find all the complexes that all the proteins are involved in. And people have done that, as I said, pretty successfully in yeast and E. coli. People have started trying to do similar experiments in fly and human, but they have to be pretty fo focused experiments for reasons of just complexity and some experimental barriers. These methods aren't really scalable up to the entire genome in humans. So how can we, instead of doing this one at a time through this laborious process of these kind of difficult single experiments, 
How can we do it in a, in a more high throughput way? And the simple idea that we're, that we're going for is that these protein complexes, we're basically just looking for proteins that are stuck together. And so one way to identify proteins that are stuck together is to take your sample and separate it out according to different biochemical principles and just look for cases where proteins seem to be aligned in this separation more than they should otherwise be. So just a simple example here is say this is a sucrose gradient where you have a column of liquid, a column of, of sucrose dissolved in water, and it's less dense at the top, more dense at the bottom. You spin it in a centrifuge and the less, you, sorry, you, you uh, split open your cells and, and put it on this column. You spin it on a centrifuge and the less dense things in your sample float to the top, the more dense things on the bottom, so it separates out your sample and that's all I'm trying to communicate there. And if these proteins are stuck together, they're going to be found at the same, the same point in that separation. And so that's what you're looking for. And if you separate the sample in a number of different ways, for example, we can separate samples by charge, by density, um, by size. You can use a lot of different ways, independent, me independent means of separating out your sample so that when you find proteins that do seem to be stuck together, it's less likely that it's by chance. So technically on the back end, in terms of the experimental method, we, what we do is we take these columns of separations and we kind of bend them. We take each bend, say 100 bends, and we run each of those bends through the mass spec machine to identify all the proteins that are, that are present in each of those bends and the quantities of those proteins. And we're basically looking for proteins that are correlated in what we call their separation profile. So in this image here on the right, on the left side, you'll see the second set of blue lines are all kind of lined up at the same point. They kind of have a peak at the same place. That, that's what we call correlated separation profiles. It means those proteins are coming out at about the same point of that separation, and it implies they might be part of a complex. So to, to make this a little more computational in the visualization of how we do this, um, we do some of these separation and mass spec experiments in my lab, but a lot of them are done by a, a lab in Toronto that we collaborate with, and they have a lot of expensive machines and a lot of people running these machines that do these experiments. And it's 2013, but I still just get hard drives in the mail with terabytes of data um, and uh, put, it on, put it on TAC, which we're very thankful to have free access to here at UT. That's a, it's a huge compute cluster um, where we can do a lot of the processing. So this stage of the processing, you can't see that image at the bottom at all, but this is just to represent that I'm going from this raw mass spec data down at the bottom here to quantified proteins in every sample. So there, we've got 7,000 experiments that have been done, and we've got the quantity of every protein in every one of those experiments. So, um, so from that, the, the features that are going to go into trying to find these complexes, as I mentioned, is correlations. So we're calculating correlations between every pair of proteins here. And one thing that uh, becomes a problem if you do this just kind of the simplest way possible, just using correlations, is, the, is false positives. Because you have, um, we're searching the entire space of more than 10,000 proteins, possibly interacting with more than 10,000 other proteins. And very few of those interactions are true, so false positives tend to overwhelm the, 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 the issue. So one thing that we can do is, and what that we do is um, integrate in a lot of what we call prior knowledge biological background sets. So these are existing databases that are out there in the wild that um, say that, that imply that, that genes are functionally related or otherwise related. Any kinds of data sets that we can integrate together with our data that makes it more or less likely that two genes are actually likely to be part of the same complex. So that's what makes our features. So we actually do this in a, in, in a it's just a supervised machine learning problem for every possible pair of proteins. So for any pair of proteins, we have its correlation scores from all these experiments that we've done. And then we also have this prior background knowledge. And then we just do supervised learning on this um, to first uh, predict these pairwise interactions. So just using scikit-learn and the modules in there, um, using SVMs or um, using the extra trees, for instance, both of those work quite well at just creating this basically hairball diagram of, of proteins interacting and, and how likely they are to interact with every other possible protein in this way. And then using a couple of different existing clustering algorithms, um, in particular right now I'm using both cluster one and MCL, um, we can just basically look for dense connected parts of this network and lift those out and those are our protein complexes and it actually works quite well doing this. Um, <clears throat> And the nice thing about all of these modules that exist in Python, especially the machine learning modules in scikit-learn, is that 
all of the sort of most changing and, and most uh, iteratively developing parts of the process, I can manage all within Python, and it's, it's extremely nice. And this makes this an actually manageable problem to do on these biology data sets, um, whereas uh, people who are trying to do this using a bunch of disjoint methods, I, I think, would have, would have trouble managing this much data and, and, and putting all this together. Um, <clears throat> So this, this was published uh, a little under a year ago for just some human data that we had. So about 18 different fractionations with a couple of different human cell lines. And this is a collaboration with several different groups, including Andrew Emily in Toronto. And we've kept going from there. In Toronto and here, we've been um, getting more samples from more species. We now have data from humans, mice, sea urchins, fruit flies, and, and worms. And so we just have a lot of data across a lot of species now. And that does a couple things for us. One is we can integrate this data because of the, the conserved nature of a lot of these uh, most basic mechanisms of biology. We can use the data from all the species to inform what are the actual complexes in any other species. So we integrate all the data together. Also having the data from all these different species, we can, we can use data in species specific ways that I'll, I'll mention a bit more. But um, just to give you a quick look, this is just a simple precision recall plot, just to show that here on the bottom left with the lowest recall and the lowest precision is the, is the performance that we get from just using our human experimental data. And then when we add in data from all these other species and this background data, it pushes our performance significantly up and to the right. Um, and to make this a bit more real in terms of the biology that I'm talking about, I'm gonna show a couple pictures here of the predicted complexes, and this is a work in progress. This is a couple versions ago, but it hasn't changed drastically. Um, this shows that we're, we're pre okay, so this is actually a visualization of, um, these are complexes that we have evidence for in at least two species. So we're calling this our um, conserved animal complexes map, predicted conserved animal complexes. So every interaction you see here, all of the lines between any two nodes, each line is, rep, uh, is, is supported by evidence in multiple species. We've got about 500 complexes here. All of the green ones are, um, are annotated in our, in our gold standard. Um, some of those were training and some of those were tests and it's about half and half. And all of the gray ones um, are either just unannotated, in a lot of cases they're obviously true, and in a lot of cases they're potentially novel and potentially false positives. And we're doing some experimental tests right now to see how well we do in terms of those novel complexes. Um, and just a quick look here. These are the kinds of things that come out of this. The ribosome and proteasome are there at the top. Um, and those are some of the complexes that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and then down through the map, we see a lot of things that are well known and a lot of novel things. Um, as I mentioned before, we can use this data from multiple species to try to get at, at evolutionary differences in these complexes and, and, and conservation of different interactions. So here I've just visualized that even within some complexes, we have portions of the complex where the interactions are supported by data from all of these five species. In other words, we're seeing those proteins separate together in all five species. And then in some other portions of the complex, we're only seeing those proteins separate together in a couple of the species. So it uh, it's suggests it could be a, a divergence evolutionarily, and we're looking at how, how to get at that better and, and really draw the line there in terms of what's actually diverged. Um, another thing we can do with data from different species that's gonna be extremely useful to a lot of biologists, hopefully, is that even given just a small amount of data from any one species, like I mentioned, we can leverage all of this existing data from the other species and the, uh, the prior biological knowledge that I talked about from these other data sets. And so even with a fairly small amount of data, for example, for sea urchin, we can still predict kind of a rudimentary map of complexes. And this is, this is kind of a map of biology at a, at a level um, and at a scale that, that biologists working with these model organisms don't currently have to work with right now. So it's, it's helpful for a lot of people, hopefully. And we're getting a lot of positive feedback from that. So, um, so yeah, just to sum up, by using machine learning and integrate on, integrating all of these big data sets, we're able to map out complexes in a way that's more unbiased and, and more data driven than, than people have done previously and gets a lot more coverage. Um, and the crucial aspects of success for us, obviously we have a lot of novel high throughput data that we're able to handle thanks to a lot of these, for, for me, thanks to all these Python modules and tools and, and interactive, um, interactive tools that are out there that I can use. And then, um, as I said, integrating these, what we're calling um, 
prior knowledge from biology and the computational storage capacity that we have access to at TAC. And I, I mentioned the, the mass spec processing and machine learning tools. A lot of these Python tools just are, are extremely valuable and make this a feasible project, um, whereas it might not otherwise be. Um, so just a quick thanks to other members of the Marcotte lab and the Emily lab, our collaborators in Toronto. And that's it. Thanks.